Hello, welcome to CJRU Artist Review. I'm your host, Kijo Buchanan, and today my guest was born in Calgary, grew up in Vancouver, and spent years in Montreal studying jazz performance at McGill University, currently based in Brooklyn, New York. I give you global performing artist, May Chung. Please introduce yourself, May. Hi, thank you so much, Kijo, for having me on your awesome show. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Mei Chung. I'm a singer songwriter. I lived in Brooklyn for 10 years. And when the pandemic hit, uh, we were trying to figure things out. And I now live in upstate uh, New York in this town called New Paltz. Um, yeah, and uh, it's so funny because I switched from jazz to being a folk singer songwriter yeah, a few years back, I mean, I'd say like five, six years ago. And now I feel like I'm in this like community of Hudson Valley musicians where there's so much history um, with singer songwriters with Pete Seeger, uh, Lee Von Helm, um, just like endless amount of singer songwriters who have left an indelible mark um, in the Hudson Valley and New York. So you're continuing so that legacy, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're joining the Hudson Valley legacy. Awesome. That's pretty cool. Um, if you don't mind backtracking just a little bit and maybe talk a little bit about your um, maybe in earlier influences in Miguel, like what convinced you to even study jazz? That's a really good question. Um, I was really into R&B and soul when I was like 12 or 13. Um, Celine Dion, Mariah Carey. And so I just had a really a strong uh, affinity towards singing and, and music. So I sang to my choir director uh, and, and in high school, and he asked me if I had ever heard of jazz. And I was like, yeah, I think my dad has played a couple of records, you know, John Coltrane or something like that. And awesome. he's like, you know what, I think you should try it. And so Fast forward to when I was 14, I uh, I auditioned for, I got my first gig uh, at a McDonald's. And, really? Yes. And, and awesome. I, it, was a, it was a paying gig too. And so it was like an opening and, and him and I, I mean, honestly, if it weren't for this teacher, whose name is Spencer Bach, by the way, um, B-A-C-H, uh, Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm influenced by Bach and jazz. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go on. Literally. So um, if it weren't for him, honestly, I don't think, I don't know where I would be. I wouldn't have the guidance and the, and the, and the structure to, and, mm -hmm. and confidence to have applied for McGill in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I got my first gig there. And, and then we, we did a couple of other gigs and it was just like a great, introduction into the gigging life and then eventually I I banded up with a bunch of other teenagers and we had we formed the Mei Chung Quartet or Quintet depending on how many people were in showed the, up right at the time <laughs> yeah it was amazing we did you know we did a couple other gigs too some talent shows and then and then it came time to apply for university we all went our separate ways and um I had my heart set on the gill but I had applied to other universities um uh, somehow I skipped Toronto. I don't know why, but okay. <laughs> um, our loss. But, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am here. I'm here where I am. Exactly. Uh, I, yeah, That's and I, and I got in. I honestly, I was so so surprised. I I really did not expect it at all. And they only take about two people per year. Um, they take a they they accept locals, and you know they they prefer to accept people from Quebec um, and then and then elsewhere. And then kind of branch out. Okay. Well, yeah. I guess it, it helps to be in Montreal then, the geographics kind of, but also you're already conducting your own band. So congratulations on that at such an early age, right? Having your oh, own quintet was, quartet. Yeah, yeah. I, we had to, we, we, it was a, it was a learning curve, but it was like a really, it was nice to work with other teenagers who were, um, who also were finding their way in terms of managing or being in a band or knowing what their positions are or we're just all feeling it out and 
Yeah. How you get it. Um, yeah, there was very little ego. I mean, sure, it was my name, but it was actually my friend who suggested you, we should just name it. You, you're the leader, and and that became that. So, um, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of driving to gigs that didn't pay anything, but we were so gung ho about playing and just the opportunity to play in anywhere and everywhere. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then and then since then, uh, I, I studied with Renee Lee, who's who has the Order of Canada. Um, oh. She's an incredible jazz vocalist and um, one of the darlings of of jazz voice in Canada and Juno so, Award winning. Maybe. So there you go. You have some really excellent influences and starts into your music, and I understand. You know, I see the the strong jazz foundation, but is there other? I mean other performers that you find have really also influenced your work? Yeah, so uh, Simon and Garfunkel, Joni Mitchell. I love them. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, with Jolly yeah. Journey and the folk, so. <laughs> yeah, totally. so, yeah, so awesome. Um, <laughs> and uh, a little bit of, i say, a feist. Um, uh there's so many oh neil young and leonard cohen uh i loved um i loved one of his records um it was a famous blue raincoat i think that was mm -hmm. and um yeah it's just beautiful lyrics and um yeah it's great ballet. lyricist and the poetry in that is just tremendous so like well, with all those inspirations, and I know there's a lot of categories you're falling into jazz, pop, folk, and indie rock, and all these different categories, but how would you, as a songwriter, how do you describe your lyrical and instrumental style? It took me a while to figure out where I, you know. It doesn't have to be genre, just how you feel. Yeah, however you feel it is. Mm -hmm. Um. I guess it would be singer songwriter in the broadest sense without any genre uh, formalities. Yes. Um, I think that would be, that would best fit me, that best suit me because I, I love singing all kinds of genres. I, I love listening to all kinds of genres of music, including country. There's some really good country music, uh, old country music that's yes. just, goes straight to the heart and then heart. twist. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's something, something direct like, about the style, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I think of music less as a genre. I try not to think of the genre before I write the music. I just mm -hmm. try to think of the message and, and what um, I'm trying to convey at the moment. Um, and, the, and I guess that's where a voice recording, you know, device, i.e. a phone is the most useful thing. Um, yeah. Yes. So. Excellent. Yes. And, and it, how you mentioned that, I can see that a lot when I'm listening to, I've had the pleasure of playing your title track, The Departure on Jolly Journey. And I, I know this it was released out in 2017. Now you did mention it captures your uh, departure from the past and recounts the process towards finding ground again. But maybe you wanna speak a little bit more on the departure because I do hear a lot of different styles and you're really playing a lot in that. And so is the departure more to you as well? I went through a really rough breakup and it it was not um it was not entirely that person that that i had to write about it, a large part of it was like the catalyst the breakup was the catalyst but um it was like a culmination of 11 years of being in a series of monogamous relationships and i hadn't been on my own and so you know, at the time I was in my thirties, so early thirties. So, I mean, that just is like a third of my life. I was in serious monogamous relationships starting from my really, from, from my teenage years. So I, I 
really didn't have any strong identity um, mm. that was uh, that was that was coming from me. So I had to write about it. I had to uh, express that sort of departure from uh, naivete and um, innocence, really. Mm -hmm. into a stark reality um, of being my own person, having my own opinions, having my own thoughts and, 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 and research on, on, on who I am really at the core of it, because it's so easy to be immersed in a relationship and forget who you are and, and not really have an identity or have your partner's identity be a part of yours. And so to break away from that is it's 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 dismembering those parts of yourself and reevaluating like is this really me is mm -hmm. this who i want to be and um is this where i want to be which is actually a title of a uh, another song on the album but yes yeah and so so yeah, so it was just really that it, it it's uh, another it's not another breakup album. Yes, it is another breakup album. Everybody writes about it, <laughs> but but it it, it but it's it, also discovery, right? Yeah. you're you're unfolding your own self into this work, mm -hmm. and we're getting to see you as you are. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and that journey and and what it took to find myself. Um, yeah, and along with a couple of other vignettes of, of uh, uh, leaving Montreal, because essentially what happened was I moved to New York to be with a lover and my boyfriend at the time, and I just moved into a new country, moved into a new city, into New York City, Brooklyn. Um, and, and prior to that, I, I did get a chance to visit New York and get a taste of what it was like to live there um, as I got a Canada Council grant to study uh, for a few months. And so I, I already knew what it was like, but then, yeah, I, I met someone and, and there you go. <laughs> just uprooted, just uprooted my life. I actually had, I, I was offered a job, a full-time job at a uh, as a music teacher um, at a private school in Montreal and I, I, I declined and I just uprooted myself and moved to New York because I felt like I'm in my mid twenties. Like if there's any time to do it, it'd be now. Mm -hmm. I did. I took the risk at the time. It, it didn't really, it didn't feel like a risk because it just felt like it was the right thing. So mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there you are. New York is lucky to have you because you're still there, right? And yes. I guess you're taking, yeah, you're taking the most right out of it right now. And I'm uh, just curious though, but where did you, um, where did you film the title track video? I filmed it on a beach. Um, oh gosh, what is that beach called? It's close to, it's like the south of maybe like the southernmost part of Brooklyn. Okay. Um, and there's like a, there's like a beach there. Um, and it's actually like a national, is it a national park? I have to figure it out because um, basically it's, it's a super eight um, medium that, mm -hmm. that the video was shot with. And um, it's, it's, I think you get with every role, you get maybe a few minutes and then okay. that's it. Yeah. And yes. Got, because I noticed there are just clips in, in the way that it was, it was done and directed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was very creative. Thanks. No yeah. problem. Yeah. I, I love that aesthetic, uh, the sort of vintage. The, yeah. Yes, and because you're that. recapturing, right? It's like the departure and you're recapturing, I guess, um, some of the past and where you're going in the future. So it's kind of interesting because it's like we're going through photographs of you yeah. as, opposed to, as opposed to just straight film. So it's kind of cool. It's, yeah, it has a nice aesthetic. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's a, <laughs> we, wanted to, we wanted it to be a dreamlike state. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so that's where we shot it. If you don't mind, um, do you want to talk cer certainly about your current bands? Because like you said, you do go into just different styles. And, um, and I've noticed that in the Departure album, but also with your most recent, um, just last month, you in April, you had Part of Your Life that was released with Dove's Peak and you're working with Russell Crane. So did you want to talk a little bit about working on that? Yeah, so I formed a duo with my friend Russell Cranes, who's an incredible gospel, gospel jazz pianist. And uh, we got together, he, he's like, I have some songs that I've been looking for a singer to sing um, on, and I think you'd be great for it. And so we just jammed a bunch and uh, decided to form an official duo and we recorded it in my garage um, <laughs> once we moved up here um and it was a it was an interesting experience it was it was awesome to to take the reins and diy and yeah that's become stuff. a garage band again <laughs> exactly <laughs> we're bringing garage band back and so yeah it was awesome and uh but we also recorded it in garage band that's that's how it was yeah. how, that's how meta it was but exactly but uh then in post-production we got my friend Tariq khan who has done work with d'angelo erica badu um and bilal and uh he did an incredible job being creative with with the limited amount of uh files and, and 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 material that he had because it was literally just me and him me and russell so it's just two tracks but with the artistry that Tariq and uh, the the artistry and the experience that Tariq has he just made it fuller than yes two people yeah um, on it so yeah we were very very lucky to have him be a part of this project um so right now we're just we're just pitching to playlists as everyone does and exactly and, but it's and a very that. polished product so um project so yeah thank you thank yeah. you for sharing that and thank you for reaching out with it um i really appreciate that and if you don't mind um do you mind talking just a little bit about scorpion mouse because that's another one that um you seem to be sampling more your ethereal vo vocals with that. And do you want to talk a little bit about that experience? Because I know you're traveling around and everything when you were doing um, Scorpion Mouse work. Oh, yeah, Scorpion Mouse. Yes. Um, it's a really interesting project <laughs> um, with my partner and I. Um, so he creates the code. He creates code that generates music. And I usually just improvise on it. Mm -hmm. And in a normal setting, the uh, you see the code projected in the in our in, like behind us or yes. our faces. Mm -hmm. And then I work with a pedal to change my voice and alter it, filter it um, using yeah using a pedal. And um, I just have like no limits. I don't have any boundaries. There's no form structure. There's no song structure. Um, I just go with it. And sometimes I'll take a, a, a book of poetry and just improvise a melody based on what I, what's in there. And, you know, I, most recently I took um, Greta Thunberg's book and I just like sang oh, really? a melody using the words that she was writing in her books. Um, and using Swinburne, Leonard, uh, Leonard Nimoy, I've used. Um, so in scientific journals, sometimes I'll do that. Oh, that is so cool. Improvise melodies. <laughs> um, or just straight up improvise. It's almost like I, I should, I should work on my spoken word skills or like rap, like get, you know, start rapping or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because get your dub helps. poetry or something out there and just start doing your thing, right? Yeah. And yeah. it just like just doing that gives me like elevated admiration for rappers just thinking on the fly or even just writing that amount that incredible amount of material. 
um, to rap about. So, yeah. So soon um, you'll be spitting your rhymes and then we get to all enjoy that soon. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah. so like, you never know. Cause you're already going through that experimental kind of phase, which is really cool. That is really cool. I like that. Yeah. And it's just one of those projects where, uh, you know, my partner and I are, we were great together, but when we play music together, we're, we're also very aligned, which is very, it's, it's rare um, to find, but I think it just comes from being sensitive to each other's uh, sound and kind of knowing each other's style and knowing when to like break, when to stop, when to, you know, this is like, it, it feels like we're gonna end, we're gonna end here and we do. So um, uh, we had the wonderful opportunity to play at South by Southwest in 2019. Yes. And it came up totally randomly and um, it was uh, sponsored by Lush and I think a British Arts uh, Council also um, sponsored that project. Um, and it was our friends that had asked us our friends in the UK who do the specific kind of coding called live coding and they they're they're a duo called algo babes and they're awesome. two women yeah, <laughs> two women who write code and they just you know spit off of each other one does visuals one does music and vice versa i think they're they're very well versed in visual coding and musical coding so um yeah and that was a an amazing experience. Um, although I was I was surprised by many aspects of being the artist in South by Southwest. I mean, yeah, like with with everything, there's the clout that comes with playing these festivals. But then behind the scenes, there are some things where you're like, oh, that's the artist lounge. It's like outdoors. It's super messy. There's hot dogs. <laughs> on the ground like <laughs> really the glamorous life right? oh yeah and then right right next door is the corporate like opening tent area and like I accidentally walked in because I thought oh this must be the artist lounge because it's so nice and you know proper you're giving it handing out freebies and everything and stuff and yeah then, you know, this is this is where I belong. <laughs> you know, they, they're like, can we see your wristband? I'm like, hey, yeah, I, I I can come in, right? And they're like, no, you're on the other side. And I'm like, <laughs> you're with the hot what? dog people. Hot dog people. <laughs> this is caviar and champagne yeah. people. I'm oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> hot dogs and tacos. And it was like it was like you know bean bean and rice tacos for everybody. <laughs> um, oh wow. So, yeah, it was it was it was whatever the lavish life it's funny yeah. because when you're reading you're reading you're reading description you're like oh she's been all this and she's not southwest southwest is like hold on oh yeah <laughs> there's some reality to this oh yeah you don't know half the story <laughs> <laughs> i know so what we'll do we'll do a 2.0 version of this yeah yeah <laughs> you can tell me more about um some of your best experiences as it were but yeah thank you thank you for sharing and, that story that and the scenes <laughs> behind the scenes it's Mei Chung here we go but um exactly you can tell us all the insight but I know <laughs> but I know you've also been having some fun um with some recent live performances right mm -hmm. um I noticed that you also have um and and some community outreach so if you don't mind do you mind talking a little bit first about the um about the Asian woman music healing events that you did yeah, so I um, it was actually my friend Kristen Fung who was a part of it, uh, but but it, it, I attended it and it was I really wanted to push that uh, event and share it with everyone um, because it's so near and dear to my heart. And for for a long time, I felt like I was the one Asian girl or woman or like the token Asian woman who would be part of any sort of festival or like any scene really I mean it, it's it's getting better I mean there are more and more Asian women in the music scene 
um, but I didn't know many. Um, and for many years, people have asked me, do you know Kristen Fung? And I'm like, no. They're like, you should totally meet her. And for years, I would say like four years, people are asking me like, you should, you should hang out with her. And so one day I, I think I reached out to her or I saw a post that she was in town and I was like, Hey, I wanted to pin her down. I was like, Hey, you know what? Let's go for ramen because we need to meet like, this yes. is, this is ridiculous. We need to make this happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so we did, and it was like looking in a mirror. I was actually writing a post about her, but I totally got that back. <laughs> but because our stories aligned so similarly, like we, it, it was like we were both from Vancouver. Mm. Um, we both went to school out east to study jazz. Mm. We both, yeah, like it just went on and wow. on and on. I just, she has freckles. I have freckles. Like it was like <laughs> have so many similar paths going on, right? Yeah, it yeah. was very, very awesome to finally meet her and to understand and to not feel so alone mm -hmm. in this path. Of course, I felt supported. Like there's no question that I was supported and I have been feeling supported this whole time but not in the same way that I would perceive my like um, Caucasian counterparts to have been supported in, and it's, it's so subtle, like the, it's just so subtle and tiny minuscule differences, I think, but because, because I don't know how people perceive me, you know, yeah. I just, I just only work with what I, what I know which, and what you know. What, mm -hmm. Yeah. I work with what I know. I work with, um, what I feel is the right thing to do. And, and, uh, I think it was also a combination when we were talking, we, Kristen and I, it was like, um, you know, you, you apply for grants and you just, you never know, you apply for things, you apply for, you, you apply to venues and you just never know. Um, you don't know how people perceive you. Um, but after having met her and spoken to her um she apparently had her own circle of asian artist female artists that uh, in toronto that she was connected with and i had no idea um at all and then slowly but surely next thing you know she's writing an article through colty collective which is a, a blog um an asian centric um, blog mm -hmm. about the the top 14 emerging Asian artists in Canada. That is, that's how I found your name, actually, was through that blog. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I'm so glad she did write it because it's like, yeah, I'm looking for, because of my show, I try to um, really highlight, you know, uh, people in the talent of folk and acoustic that don't necessarily get the stage. Right. And they're not always highlighted. So it was really cool. So, yes. Yeah, so you can thank her for me for that. That was a really good, um, great writing. But go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah. And um, and so she wrote this this thing. And it's not it's not only. You're not the first person who's discovered me through that blog. And so that's so it because, works. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, and it's because it is exactly because it is so rare. It's rare. It's mm -hmm. let's, just, let's just put it out there because yes, the majority of um, musicians are ethnically white, or you know what I mean. Like it's yeah. I don't see a lot a lot of people of color. I don't see a lot of black or Asian or indigenous artists now are being more highlighted because of recent events. I see them more through festivals and those sorts of things. But yes, it's nice to find, especially in within the Canadian talent realm, you know, and then of certain styles, it's kind of nice to see that there's, um, yeah. There's some representation. Some representation there. Yeah. And, and some great, great talent. And, and with recent tracks and recent information, you know, recent um, albums, and it's really nice to be able to highlight no, regardless of the time, but you get what I mean. Like, there's just nice to know that there's a current set of, of artists like yourself that are out there, you know, mm -hmm. 
yeah. we're, we're floating out there. And, <laughs> and I recently did another interview with a friend of mine, Eunice K-10, who's incredible. We did a show together um, yes. maybe two weeks ago, and she's incredible as well. Yes. The Harmony Lodge sessions that you guys That's did. right. That's yes. right. We did that show together. And, um, and she interviewed me and asked me a, a, a pressing question because I think it resonates with a lot of um, Asian Americans or Asian North Americans. Mm -hmm. And that is the pressure that, that surrounds y you as an offspring of Asian parents. Um, you get a lot of pressure f to, to excel in life and to be financially stable and, and to, you know, overachieve or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's very prevalent. I mean, not only in in Asian culture, but it it's prevalent in so many other cultures. And I I, I brought that up too. But I was very very blessed, and I'm I'm not religious, but um, I I feel very very lucky that my parents were fully supportive pretty much the whole way. And I don't know I don't know why, but. <laughs> You were fortunate, right, to, to support yeah. you. You mean like in, in a creative way, because sometimes by saying you want to be an artist, it's like you're swearing to be poor for life. You know, it's like, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's not what they're hearing. Some parents, they're like, oh, so you want to be poor? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Yeah. And it's like, no, I want to be an artist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, well, that's good. That's good that your parents, well, like you said, your father was already... Um, dropping some jazz LPs. So it sounds like you already had some strong um, creative influence in your house anyway, in your home. So that's mm -hmm. good. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. glad to hear that they were able to support you um, on this journey for yourself. But yeah, well, you've done well with it. So <laughs> it was worth all the investment. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, more, more to come. I, I, I feel very inspired. I think actually through the pandemic, I felt a bit more empowered mm -hmm. um, because I have I don't have other voices or any noise that yes. interferes with my personal thoughts, despite how it can be negative thoughts too. But at least I have the space and time to really think um, about my next moves and my path. And I because it has been a rocky path it hasn't been easy at all it has been like do i go into coding which i may still do but do i change careers do i do i uh just just quit music and i've thought about that many 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 times i've doubted myself like is this the right thing um but then i think along with meeting Kristen and talking to her and having, and now having developed the whole network of Asian women uh, who are on this path together, it feels like we are together now We're we're, we're allies mm -hmm. and we can support each other. And that's like four of us, maybe five, but that, that number will grow. And I told Eunice, like, you know, if I won't, if I'm not the one to be, like famous or anything. I'm not, I'm not aiming for fame. That's not, that's not what I want. Um, maybe when I was way younger, I was quite aggressive and competitive, but um, I feel like I'm at this point in my life where if I can inspire uh, young Asian women to pursue music fully and conf confidently, then I feel like I would have done my job and I would have, then I, then I have, then I can die happy, you know, and I, yes. I've left some sort of legacy because oftentimes we really rely on numbers and, and quantity to determine our value, mm -hmm. um, whether it's finances or how many plays you get, how many streams you get. Uh, that is part of the business. Um, and when you're just your own manager, when you're wearing so many hats, um, you just do your best, right? And maybe for the next person, next little girl who whose dream it was to to become a famous singer or whatever, an artist, um, and, and if she sees that 
she's being represented. She was being, she is being represented by someone who did, who did the same thing, like many, a decade or two um, earlier, then great. I mean, you know, uh, I, I think I mission, mission accomplished. I think so. And I think that's exactly what you're doing. You're creating like two things that you just, well, there are th three things that I find interesting that you just raised. And that is one, yes, you're absolutely right. There is this quiet. I, I keep saying that to people. It's like, I got to just enjoy this and do the best I can with the quiet because when the noise comes back, you know, it's going to be totally different. And so, yeah, it gives you a chance to really be in your own head, but also you're laying groundwork. You're laying groundwork for other young Asian performers coming up behind you or aspiring and thinking about it. And so, yes, I absolutely, there's, and there is a longevity when you have cultural peers within your profession, it totally does change your mind on certain things because there are things that I've walked away from for that exact same reason that you're saying, you know, I still have my tech side, right? But mm -hmm. there is that pushback um, in technical and anything IT, anything, um, well, for me, it's coming from a library perspective, but anything in that when you're not male or white. And, and so it's very, it it's, can be a very hard world to become a part of, right? Professionally, when you don't see, and there are black digital, digital women out there and there are Asian digital women out there and <laughs> in that world, but it's just finding them. And it's the same thing for music. It's finding other people doing exactly what you're doing to feel that sense of, um, sense of value. So even from your, it, and, and I do feel it. I do feel it. I hear it from you as well. And I hear it from other artists that encourage me because there's a moment, even as I'm doing this work and wondering, you know, am I really, spending the best of my time doing the show and and sometimes I second guess it but then I realize this is a part of the journey and and that's okay to feel a little bit <laughs> insecure from time to time that that goes with it but it also helps when you do get that um, reaffirmed um, by artists like yourself to to continue so yes thank you you're, you're setting the groundwork with a very specific um, generation in mind but the offsite of it is that you're also inspiring others immediately around you. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, just for having this platform to speak about these sort of issues because yeah, it's uh, mm -hmm. very, very important. It is, it's yeah. very important. Representation is so important. So thank you mm -hmm. for speaking out on that. Mm -hmm. And um, so is there anything else though on the horizon that you would like, um, like listeners to know about for yourself? I'm working on a new single and I've, I've decided um, it's, I'm still working on it, but <laughs> it will be released very soon. Um, I know artists are very bad with dates. Yeah, soon, 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Soon, don't worry, soon. Just give me another year, okay? <laughs> At least. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so it's called You Are Not Alone. And the song was written um, in light of a couple of my friends living on their own during the pandemic, and they were, they were holed up. Um, by themselves in their apartments in Brooklyn or New Jersey, wherever they are. And a couple times, I, I think the song just, just came out on its own and it's very, also very rare that that happens, but I, I had to tweak some lyrics here and there, but essentially I had the, the groundwork laid out in, in my head and the melody just kept on like- Rolling. Ro yeah, the, the, it kept on rolling and it kept on pestering me. I need to be written, like, please. Yeah, yeah right now. Because <laughs> I'm not going to leave your head. Um, so it's an earworm for a little while. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's coming out soon. Um, and I'm currently working on live shows, booking some some live shows here and there. Oh, great. Uh, in the Hudson Valley. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I, I have some fans that have been asking me about doing my weekly series again. Yes. I used to call it Wednesdays 
and <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it was every Wednesday. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, so it could be Thursdays. I don't even know yet. Uh, see. So figuring you know, out my schedule. <laughs> it's all on the vibe. We'll figure it out. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, awesome. So we'll see. But um, you are not alone. Look up. You are that. not alone. It's coming mm-hmm. out soon. Mm-hmm. And um, and so where do we find you on the interwebs? You can find me on my website, uh, maychung.com, M-A-Y-C-H-E-U-N-G. Dot com. Good awesome. things come in threes. Yes. Um, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Bandcamp is my next go-to. Um, your next go-to, um, because it has all my merch. It has you can stream the music there, uh, my album there, and a large portion of what you pay for goes to me. Yes. And, and then you also have the Bandcamp Friday, so we could take it even extra advantage of those too. Right? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Where they wave off, Bandcamp waves off um, their fee um, for artists. So, yeah. And then obviously Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, in, in order of activity. So, yes, there it is. Yes. So go straight to the website, maychung.com. And I just wanted to say, well, if there's anything else that you wanted to leave our listeners with. Be kind. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to others. Um, We're going through a lot right now. And and onwards. I mean, it just doesn't apply to now, I think. Yes. Be kind to each other. Going forward. Exactly. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mei Chung, for sharing all your experimentations, your leadership, and yes, your kindness. <laughs> and thank you um, to our technical director, Karen Young, and the production coordinator, Vet Sin, on bringing this production together. I'm Kijo Buchanan, and this is CGRU Artist Review Ashe. Thank you so much.